Hello everyone and welcome from myself and the rest of the New Hope staff. We're excited that you are tuning in here and I have a few announcements for you this weekend. The first thing I want you to be aware of is that this Sunday marks the last Sunday in our P23 or 23 days of prayer. And at six o'clock, we're gonna be having uh, our last concentrated time of prayer together. And so in the chapel at the New Hope building at six o'clock this Sunday, six o'clock p.m. this Sunday, you can come together with other believers for a time of concentrated prayer and worship. And so stop by at six o'clock this Sunday night for that. The other thing we want to remind you of is that we are still recording Bible reading. And so if you've been paying attention and been involved this past year, we've been recording um, our, our Bible reading time on our website. And so if you go to our webpage and go to the bottom, you can input how much Bible reading you've been doing each week. I think that we're actually over 20,000 chapters. Together we've read over 20,000 chapters this year. And that's amazing. And so please let us know if you've been reading. We'd love to keep track of that. The last thing, and maybe the, the biggest thing we want you to be aware of right now, is that this weekend, our services are looking a bit different, or at least where we are meeting will look a bit different. We'll still be meeting at 9.30 at the Y, at the old YMCA, and that'll be an, uh, an optional, masks are optional at that service. That's gonna keep happening the way it has been happening. But our drive-in worship is actually gonna be moving indoors so it's not gonna be drive-in anymore. Please don't try to make it drive-in. Um, we'll be walking into the chapel and it's gonna be a mask only service at 8 a.m. So at the chapel, at the New Hope building, we're gonna have a mask only service at eight o'clock a.m. We'd love to see you there. If you've been coming to the drive-in service, um, this is a great opportunity for you to come together with other believers. Again, it's gonna be a mask only service and so, that's what I have for you this weekend. We're excited to have you listening in. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Um, God bless. Hi there, welcome again to our online service here at New Hope Christian Church, broadcasting to you live, right now anyway, from the studios at uh, 3901 South Center. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 13. We're actually gonna look at two passages uh, from Luke this week. The word hypocrite was used by ancient Greek actors who portrayed several parts in a theatrical drama by putting on different masks for each character they played. The purpose of hypocrisy is to portray ourselves as different than we really are. In other words, to hide from other people the real truth about ourselves. John Orr was a fire captain in the Los Angeles area. He was so good in that role that he was eventually promoted to arson investigator. What no one knew or even suspected was that John Orr prided himself on setting fires and not getting caught. He is said to have set over 2,000 fires before he was arrested. His job as an arson investigator was a hypocritical mask to hide the truth about his other life as an arsonist. In fact, when Orr set fire to a home improvement store in South Pasadena, California that killed four people, including a two-year-old, other investigators thought it was started by an electrical uh, charge, but Orr insisted, publicly so, that it had been set by an arsonist. Uh, this guy was so uh, brazen that he wrote a novel about a fireman who was an arsonist. The book eventually became an HBO movie. The man was so obsessed, he started several fires near an arson investigators convention in 1987. Well, sin finds us out and John Orr was eventually arrested, convicted of arson and the murder of four people. He was responsible for causing many millions of dollars of damage in the Los Angeles area. John Orr was a hypocrite leading a secret double life. 
It's really bothered me in the past few months when I hear of a government leader who shuts down the local economy and then secretly has their hair done at a salon. Or when a politician or celebrity advocates for stricter gun control laws for the rest of us, while at the same time hiring bodyguards carrying guns to protect them. It's hypocritical when members of the press condemn the sexual improprieties of Christians or people with a different political affiliation from their own while engaging in similar behavior themselves. Hypocrisy is maddening, is it not? Seated at a table in the clubhouse after a game of golf, Bob told a fellow member there that he would never play golf with Jim anymore. Never. Why? The other guy asked. Because Jim is a cheater, Bob said. Well, how do you know that? Do you have some kind of proof to make that claim? Well, because after first saying that his ball was lost on a particular hole, Jim suddenly found it lying just two feet from the green. Well, the other guy reminded him, you know, Bob, those things can happen. To which Bob said, not when I had Jim's golf ball in my pocket, it can't. You know, we all play the role of hypocrite from time to time, pretending to be something different from what we really are. Even though he was told by Jesus he would do it, Peter, denied any knowledge, any relationship with Jesus three different times. How many times have we succumbed to the peer pressure around us to do something we knew was wrong? Are there secret thoughts or actions we would be ashamed of if our fellow Christ followers were to find out about them? Jesus often called out hypocrisy for what it was, a sin. In today's two passages from the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is criticized by Pharisees for doing good on the Sabbath. Jesus' rebuke of their hypocrisy should compel us to examine our lives for inconsistencies between what we profess to believe and how our beliefs impact the way we actually live. Now, the first scripture is found in Luke, the 13th chapter, and I'm going to begin reading from verse 10. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was teaching in a synagogue, he saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. She had been bent double for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and he said, Dear woman, you are healed of your sickness. Then he touched her and instantly she could stand straight. How she praised God. But the leader in charge of the synagogue was indig indignant that Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. He said to the crowd, there are six days of the week for working. Come on those days to be healed, not on the Sabbath. But the Lord replied, you hypocrites. Each of you works on the Sabbath day. Don't you untie your ox or your donkey from its stall on the Sabbath and lead it out for water? This dear woman, a daughter of Abraham, has been held in bondage by Satan for 18 years. Isn't it right that she be released even on the Sabbath? This shamed Jesus' enemies, but all the people rejoiced at the wonderful things he did. Let's go to chapter 14 in Luke, beginning with verse 1. Another story. One Sabbath day, again, Jesus went to eat dinner in the home of a leader of the Pharisees. And the people were watching him closely. Now there was a man there whose arms and legs were swollen. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in religious law, Is it permitted in the law to heal people on the Sabbath day or not? When they refused to answer, 
Jesus touched the sick man and healed him and sent him away. Then he turned to them and he said, which of you doesn't work on the Sabbath? If your son or your cow falls into a pit, don't you rush to get him out? And again, they could not answer. You have to admire the faith of the lady in Luke chapter 13. She could not straighten her back. She had to walk bent over, and she had been doing this for 18 years. And I'm sure that as she would walk out in public, she had seen the eyes of many people staring at her over the years. Now, in that Jewish culture, it would have been assumed that God was punishing her for some kind of sin in her life. Nevertheless, I'm sure she had prayed time and time again for healing. And even though it seemed as though her prayers had gone unanswered, she still faithfully attended worship there in the synagogue. Well, on this particular Sabbath day, Jesus was teaching in her synagogue. And when Jesus saw this woman in her condition, he had compassion on her, as he always does. Jesus could have healed this woman on any day of the week. But Jesus deliberately chose this day and this place to heal this woman as a lesson. When the leader of the synagogue addressed the people, not, did not look at Jesus, he addressed the congregation and told them they could be healed on any of the other six days of the week, Jesus rebuked him. Why is it okay for you to care for your animals on the Sabbath, but not this woman? Why are animals more important to you than people? The lesson here is clear. It is Satan who puts people in bondage, both physically and spiritually. It is God who sets people free. And brothers and sisters, what was true 2,000 years ago is still true today. When the Son of God, Jesus Christ, sets us free from whatever we are in bondage to, we are truly, we are really free indeed. Now, if we'll turn to Luke chapter 14, we see on another Sabbath, probably after the synagogue service was over, a prominent Pharisee had invited the master to eat at his house along with some of his pharisaical friends. There just happened to be a man present with a very abnormal swelling in his body. Quite certain he had been invited by the Pharisees. No doubt the Pharisees expected that Jesus would heal this man. After all, our Lord has compassion on every human need, physical and spiritual. These Pharisees were looking for something they could use to criticize and condemn Jesus for. I'm telling you, evil people do not care how they use others for their own wicked purposes. But nothing catches Jesus by surprise. Our Lord knows what lies in the human heart. He's never caught off guard by the things uh, we do and say. These individuals wanted to trap Jesus, but Jesus turns the situation around with a question that traps them instead. If an ox or a cow, a child, falls into a well on the Sabbath, who of you would not go in and rescue that, that cow or that ox or that child? Well, what could they say? Their silence spoke volumes. Their hypocrisy had been exposed. So I want to look at a couple of characteristics of hypocrisy. The first is this. Hypocrisy uh, ignores or is blind to our own shortcomings. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addresses the temptation to be hypocritical in three very important disciplines 
that should exist in a believer's life. If you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, we see in verse 2, first of all, Jesus says that when you give, don't blow uh, trumpets and call attention to your kindness like the hypocrites do. In Matthew 6 and verse 5, Jesus says, when you pray, don't do so out on the streets where everyone can see and hear you like the hypocrites do. In Matthew 6 and verse 16, Jesus says, when you fast, don't call attention to yourselves like the hypocrites do. By using the word when instead of the word if, Jesus was stating it was an expectation his followers would give and pray and fast. These are not optional habits only the most spiritually qualified spiritual giants do for extra credit. These are expectations of every Christian believer. What Jesus was denouncing was the insecurity of those who draw attention to themselves when they give or when they pray or when they fast. Jesus would let the Pharisees have it again in Matthew chapter 23. Uh, those who insist that Jesus was never controversial, that he was always kind and loving and forgiving, uh, must overlook these passages. In, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus calls the religious leaders of his day hypocrites, blind guides, whitewashed tombs, snakes, brood of vipers, and the list goes on. The Pharisees were very quick to point out uh, others not adhering to their traditions while ignoring their own disobedience to God's law. Mark Twain was spot on when he said, we're all like the moon. We all have a dark side we don't want anyone to see. In his book entitled The Four Loves, C.S. Lewis says that we all have a tendency to exaggerate the depth of our positive qualities while treating our flaws with a great deal of leniency. We either consciously or subconsciously put forward a better image of ourselves than what really exists. But there are times in all of our lives when how we appear on the outside and the reality of who we are on the inside don't match. And spiritual growth occurs when we acknowledge that reality and take action to ensure that what we do on the outside matches who we are on the inside. Secondly, we see also then that um, hypocrisy focuses on the shortcomings of others. It's expecting more from others than we expect from ourselves. In Matthew 7, Jesus asks a very pointed question. Why do you make mention of uh, the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and fail to mention the uh, beam of wood that's coming out of your own eye? That's a terrible temptation that we all uh, are guilty of, pointing out the shortcomings of others while ignoring our own shortcomings. In his book entitled, The Jesus I Never Knew, Philip Yancey tells about the time he was leading a Bible study uh, on this very issue. And the class members began to share some of their examples from their experiences when Yancey talked about the hypocrisy of a Moody Bible Institute that he attended in the early 1970s. At that time, the college banned all male students from having any facial hair or any hair growing over their ears. But Yancey pointed out, at the same time, every day, the students passed by a large painting of Dwight Moody who obviously had a very full beard. And all the members of uh, Yancey's group laughed at that hypocrisy but one. Greg said, uh, I became a Christian 
through the ministry of Moody Bible Church. And while you all are pointing out the hypocrisy of that ministry uh, or Moody himself, you yourselves are acting like Pharisees by looking down on others. <laughs> Yancey said, um, I was embarrassed and I was trapped. I waited to receive some kind of inspirational response and nothing came to my mind and the silence was very loud. I want to then look at the damage of hypocrisy, first of all, to ourselves. The Apostle John says, if we claim to have no sin, we're really only fooling ourselves and, and not living in the truth. Through the prophet Amos, God said in the Old Testament, he hates religious hypocrisy. And Jesus warned that unredeemed hypocrites are assigned a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Don Richards was from Cleveland, Ohio. While he was visiting Texas in 1989, he stopped by the newspaper office of the Valley Morning Star in Harlingen, Texas. Richards said the newspaper should do more to, quote, encourage motorists to use their seatbelts. And he said the reason for his crusade was that his wife had died in a, a minor car accident because she had neglected to uh, strap uh, the lap uh, buckle across her. And yet, only one year later, the Valley Morning Star received news from Cleveland that Donald Richards had been involved in a head-on car crash on a country road, and state police said he was not wearing his seatbelt, and he died when his head hit the windshield. Here's the thing, so long as we refuse to confront the truth concerning our actions or our words, we're gonna to continue to reap the consequences of such sin, whether it's family and friends abandoning us, whether we're going through depression, whether we lose our job, maybe even death itself. Second damage of hypocrisy is what it does to others, to our family, our friends, our coworkers, and more. Again, in, in Matthew 23, Jesus says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? You are hypocrites because your actions prevent others from entering the kingdom of heaven. When you do convert someone, you load them down with so many rules, they are worse hypocrites than yourselves. A driver instructor in Massachusetts was drunk while giving a driving lesson to a student. A convenience store clerk smelled alcohol on his breath and reported uh, what she had saw when she, when she observed him getting in a school car to give a driver's lesson. How many times had he in instructed his students not to drink and to drive? If this clerk had not taken action, who knows how many might have been hurt either then or later on. Whether it's alcohol, pornography, gambling, laziness, more. Others, including our loved ones, are oftentimes the victims of our hypocrisy when we teach them to live one way, but violate our own teaching and do something different. And then I want to look at the damage hypocrisy does to the Lord. John Ortberg writes about a man being tailgated by a, a woman in a hurry. When the light turned yellow at an intersection, he slammed on his brakes, she slammed on her car horn. And while she is going ballistic hollering at this guy, a policeman taps on her, her uh, car window. She's taken to the police station where she is searched and fingerprinted. And after a couple of hours, she is released and the arresting officer apologized to her. He said, when I pulled up to your car and, and saw what would Jesus do bumper sticker and a choose life license plate holder, 
the follow me to Sunday school window decal and the Christian fish emblem on your trunk and then observed you blowing your horn, using bad gestures and foul language, I just assumed your car had been stolen. Ortberg concludes, and I quote, the world gets tired of people who have Christian bumper stickers on their cars, Christian jewelry around their necks, vote pro-life signs in their yards and attend church, but don't actually have the life of Jesus in their bones and the love of Jesus in their hearts. It's just not a good witness for the Lord when those who claim to be his people fail to live like people of the Lord. And the question we need to ask ourselves is this, is our life pointing people to the Lord or repelling people from the Lord? But there is a cure for hypocrisy. The first thing that is needed is a new heart. Because the Bible says we were all born with an evil heart, we cannot hope to conquer any evil thoughts or actions by ourselves because they come from that heart. They emanate from, from that which is not good. We need a new heart. And God promised us even back in the Old Testament that he would someday do exactly that. So my friends, when we bury our old nature our old heart in the watery grave of baptism, we are promised and we are given a new heart. When Jesus promised your heavenly father who sees what you give in secret will reward you. Your heavenly father who sees your prayers spoken between you and him will reward you. Your heavenly father who sees you fasting without drawing attention to yourselves will reward you. Jesus was saying that a new heart longs to please God our Father who gave that heart to us. God is not just our deity. God is our heavenly Father. He creates us. He sustains us. He redeems us because he loves us. And it requires a new heart to love him back. It requires a new heart that wants to please God. Now having said that, the reality is, even after receiving a new heart, sometimes our heart still goes astray. And so realistically, even as believers, we need to examine our shortcomings. Paul reminds us that walking with Jesus in a manner consistent with his teachings and his example requires that we regularly examine ourselves to see if our faith is genuine. We regularly look in the mirror of God's word to see if we're following it. In fact, Paul writes one of the reasons Jesus established the Lord's Supper is so we would examine ourselves before we partake of the bread and the juice. And because we often miss those blind spots in our lives, we need to seek counsel from wise and godly friends. The proverb writer or author reminds us, victory is won through many advisors. The value of a friend comes from their heartfelt advice. Is there someone in our lives we can trust to speak the truth to us in love? You know, God oftentimes places people in our lives for that very purpose, to be the instrument who points us into a closer relationship with him. And then in addition to needing and receiving a new heart, uh, realistically examining our own shortcomings, we need to focus on the potential and the strength of others. One of the things that made Jesus so influentially powerful was that he chose not to dwell on a person's past, but rather on their potential. Not on their weaknesses, but on their strengths. Leprosy was a far more dreaded disease in Jesus' day than the COVID virus today. You see, there were no hospitals 
in Jesus' day. There were no experimental drugs for leprosy. There was no medical cure for leprosy. Lepers usually lived in a colony of other lepers outside of a village. They were not to have contact with anyone, including their family. And most Jews thought that a leprosy was a curse from God for some sin that we had committed or that the, the person had committed. And so it's interesting that when Jesus was near the village of Bethany, he would stay at the home of a man who was known as Simon the leper. Now, we have to assume Simon is no longer a leper. Why? Because he wouldn't be living in the village if he was. And he wouldn't be hosting this meal, this dinner uh, uh, situation with Jesus and his disciples and other guests if he was still a leper. In fact, I suspect that Simon had been healed by Jesus. How many times do people get labeled as something and never lose that label? Once a drug addict, always a drug addict. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Once a lazy bum, always a lazy bum. Once sexually promiscuous, always sexually promiscuous. Once a liar, always a liar. Once a leper, always a leper. Which sins is Jesus still holding against us? None. So when we see people as Jesus sees people, hypocrisy in our own lives will begin to fade and our impact for Christ will grow. Edgar Guest penned some 11,000 poems that were read on radio, syndicated in newspapers, and collected in 20 books. He died in 1959, and he wrote this powerful poem. Many stanzas to it. I'm just going to read one. He, he wrote, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. And the best of all the preachers are the ones who live their creeds, for to see good put in action is what everybody needs. Robert Redford was walking through a hotel lobby when a woman spotted him and followed him to the elevator. Are you the real Robert Redford? As the doors of the elevator closed, he replied, only when I'm alone. Amongst other things, Jesus Christ was sincere, genuine, and consistent. Our world needs, has seen enough and continues to see enough hypocrisy today. What the world needs today is to see the character of Jesus Christ being lived out by people who belong to Jesus Christ, not just when they're alone, but when they're with others. That is our call. What are we going to do with it? Let's pray. Our eternal Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your grace that not only saves us from our sins, but transforms our character. That uh, sees us through the eyes of um, what can be and not through the eyes of what was. Thank you, Jesus, for your example. Help us to follow your example. Help us to place people in our lives who will, who will point out to us 
those areas in which we need to change to be more consistent, to be more like Jesus. Help us to focus on the strengths and the potential of others rather than on their past. And God, as our lives begin to more and more resemble that of Jesus, use our example to impact our culture, our world, those people we know, even as Jesus did some 2,000 years ago. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank each of you for joining us on this online service and encourage you to go out and be the church wherever uh, God calls you to do life.